We made it. So I'm so excited to be here for our closing panel. I hope that for most of you this experienced uh, over the past few days, um, you experienced our team as kind of ducks on the surface of the water, that your experience was really smooth and easy. I'm going to start this concluding panel by telling you a story. So just a few days ago, actually nights ago, right before we all convened here in New Orleans, I got a call at 8.30 at night uh, from a New Orleans phone number. And I was like, oh my gosh, I gotta pick this up. I was in the Target parking lot. I sent my family in. And it was Sarita, who was our panelist yesterday up here on this stage. And she said, I know I'm scheduled to be on the closing plenary on Thursday, but I'm filming with John Legend. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> And all of you all are very important, but John Legend is really important. <laughs> and so the idea for our kind of closing session was to start with someone who was a little further on their journey as an advocate and leader, and then hear from a group of young people who are right in the thick of it right now um, as emerging leaders figuring out their trajectories, reflecting back on their experiences in K-12 schools and where they're headed. And so I gave Sarita the very easy slot of going right after Walter Isaacson. And today, we're gonna start directly with our panel of students. So the question really here is how can philanthropy listen to the young people that we seek to support? How can we celebrate their emerging leadership? So again, we're going back to our roots right here. Uh, I reached out to Kate Swinburne of Youth Force New Orleans, which is a collaboration of the education sector, the business sector, the civic sector, um, working in partnership to create career pathways for young people. I'm going to have Kate introduce the panel but I'll just say a little bit about her. Um, she's the founder of this organization. It goes back to 2015. Um, she has a background in teaching, in philanthropy, in all sorts of education leadership. Uh, and then we have added to the panel of uh, youth in her program uh, a gentleman named uh, Stanley Celestine, who is a local student who now holds elected uh, office. And so we want to be able to kind of talk about how do you bring that advocacy to life as a young person to change the system that you've grown up in. So I'm really excited to invite Kate and the panel up now. And I did the thing that Amy did yesterday. I forgot to say that if you all want to uh, include questions for the panel, this is the way you do it. You should know it by now. It's up here but not there. Yes, okay. So you're gonna go into the app to schedule and then click into this current session. You can send Kate questions. Good morning. We are so excited to be here. Uh, just a little bit more about what Celine shared and just sort of share how this panel came together. So uh, as Celine mentioned, uh, Youth Force NOLA is an education business and civic collaborative dedicated to ensuring that New Orleans public school students graduate from high school with much more than a traditional high school diploma. We want our young people to, yes, have the foundational academic skills that we know are essential for life, but we also want them to have the job-specific skills, the soft skills, and the work experiences that's gonna mean that they have a truly informed plan as they move into post-secondary, as they consider career, and as they navigate into different spaces. Uh, and so, as Celine and I talked about this panel, um, A, we had the exciting opportunity to have Stanley join us from Avoyles Parish, uh, which is not too, too far from New Orleans unless there's traffic. Um, and then we said, who, who else would be great for this panel? 
Um, and so at Youth Force this year, we are piloting a program that is essentially a fifth year of high school. We're calling it Launch. It is a bridge year program. So these young people have met all the requirements to have earned a high school diploma. And they're working with Youth Force to further develop their technical skills, get work experience in our high wage industries, further develop their soft skills, and start earning college credits. And so instead of um, bringing a random group of young people from across the city, we said within the launch cohort of 25, we've got a whole host of leaders who come from different high schools and different backgrounds and different interests and different pathways. And so let's bring them together so they can share their stories. So I am so thrilled to have all five of you here with me. Uh, we're going to just start off with the softball, which is to introduce yourselves. Um, and I think folks would love to hear um, what high school you went to, what kind of school it is, um, and just you know a little bit about your high school experience. And we'll start with Montero. Hey, everybody. I am um, um, Montero Martin, and I have went to uh, Clark High School. And uh, something that I liked about my high school, um, I liked that it was like, like hands-on. It was a small school, and like it helped us like have a strong, a strong connection with our peers, our teachers, our principal, and that's something that. I enjoyed about it because I'm a hands-on type of guy, like, and I need extra help if that makes sense. So that is what I loved about my high school. Thank you. Marlon. Um, I'm Marlon. I attended International High School, and the one thing I loved about my high school is the culture there. It says it in the name, International. It's like a lot of different people there and the one thing that stood out to me the most was the festivals. We always had Hispanic Heritage Month. We um, had the like Tet Festival and stuff like that and I always got to be a part of it. Um, it was really nice to learn the different dances because I always ended up doing like the choreography for the dance and I was really glad to be a part of that because it kind of like pushed me to the side of a hobby and something that I liked while I was in school, so whenever they had festivals, they always try to include as much students as they could. Uh, I'm Chris Lyon. Uh, I went to Warren Easton Charter High School. I want to say my experience at Easton was good, especially with the teachers, because the teachers there, they actually care about you. A lot of teachers there have won Teacher of the Year in the state of Louisiana. I want to say some of the things I don't like about it is it's on a seven point grading scale and most colleges are based off 10 point grading scales. But other than that, it was a good experience. Cool, um, my name is Micaiah. Um, I attended school at Sci High, um, not too, too far from here. Um, one of the things I loved about my school is that they really opened the door for like uh, things like internship opportunities was something I was very interested in. And thanks to my school, I've been able to like do um, things that I would have never done anywhere else. Um, been a lot of places thanks to my school. Good morning, I'm Stanley Celestine. Uh, I'm from Avalds Parish, uh, like Kate said, which is uh, a little bit over two hours uh, from New Orleans. Uh, I attended the Louisiana School for the Agricultural Sciences, uh, which uh, is a type four charter school. Uh, it is uh, authorized by both the local school district and also uh, the State Board of Education. Uh, I attended uh, LaSalle for my 7th through 12th grade years. Uh, and what I enjoyed about LaSalle was its connection to agriculture. Uh, when I entered LaSalle at 7th grade, um, I entered it more so just for the school culture and the smaller class sizes. Uh, and it provided me a lot of opportunities uh, that I did not know uh, would come. Uh, I currently attend uh, McNeese State University uh, in Lake Charles. Thank you, Stanley. So Stanley, I'm gonna take the first question then, the first next question to you, uh, and we can sort of come back this way. Um, you all have, you know, you are, you are emerging adults, and you have all done a lot of thinking about 
who you are and uh, what you enjoy doing and to sort of really, you know, I think, know yourselves well. So would be interested for you each to share an asset or a strength you learned you have or have worked to develop. And what, what, how, how was that cultivated um, with you by the adults and the support systems you had in place? So just sort of thinking about your growth, assets and strengths you have, how have the adults in your life helped you strengthen those assets? An important asset um, that I have cultivated over the years uh, is listening to connect. Um, and that's something that I've done through school and also uh, through professional experiences that I've had. I think that it's very important um, that uh, when you listen, you're able to understand uh, diverse voices, uh, experiences, and sometimes it also uh, paints a picture as to why something or a particular situation may be the way that it's going. Uh, and I'm thankful that I've had adults that have always demonstrated uh, that level of leadership uh, and uh, skill set uh, in my life. Thank you, Stanley. Makaya, you want to respond? Mm -hmm. um, recently, um, over the past couple of months, I've become more autonomous thanks to the, the people around me, um, simply because my instructors have been answering my questions with questions and pushing me to, to really understand and figure things out for myself. And that's really what I'm, I'm grateful for. That's awesome, thank you. Chris? Uh, when I was in school, I didn't really want to learn or nothing. I didn't want to go to class. And my junior teacher, my junior English teacher, Mr. E, he talked to me and he made me realize that I need to go to class, do my work to succeed in life. He gave me, I want to say, about 50 articles. I still keep each of them and read each of them daily. Thank you, Chris. Marlon? Um, I think the one thing that I kind of value the most about me, um, which is like an asset I have, is believing in myself. Um, I used to be really shy, and then I was just talking about this earlier before I came up on stage. Uh, I always think to myself, I'm like, if I'm shy or I'm nervous to do something, and like I, I'm kind of scared to do something, I think to myself, like, what is fear? And the only thing I can think of is it's fear is just your mind playing tricks on you, and it's some, you're the only person that's holding you back. So as soon as I thought about that, and I started becoming more of like comfortable with myself, believing in myself, and doing things I would have never thought I would be able to do. OK, so for me, it's like completely different than all those. <laughs> um, I, so I don't know like like uh, like like uh, how is my term right? I'm still trying to find that out. Like it's like of course I went through all high school years, right? I mean we all did, but like like it's when you like since it was so small. I didn't have uh, like a, a big experience like uh, their day. And like, I'm still tr trying to like find out what I like. And I'm, I'm taking risks, I'm experimenting of a new force. And like, I'm still trying to find that out. So it's a work in progress for me. And my strength is I am a people person, I'm energetic. <laughs> and like it helps me interact with a diverse of people. Okay. Thank you, Montero. So, you know, I think folks, and I think there's been some sessions here at the conference where, where folks are really talking about soft skills or social emotional learning. Some people call them foundational skills, essential skills. What does that mean to each of you? Uh, as you are navigating your different pathways that you're on now. Um, and I'm gonna mix it up and I'm gonna go sort of to the middle of the group. Sort of Chris or Makaya, does one of you wanna start? Sort of what, what, what does soft skills mean to you? Um, to me, soft skills is like understanding how your actions and the things you say affect the people around you, like the way that they're gonna act and respond to you. Um, and I really learned to notice this, like where I work is at a school. So it's a group of students that I'm helping every day. And not every student wants to learn or wants to be in that classroom every day. So like learning how to interact with them in a way that's gonna um, like 
be successful and turn into a positive interaction is something that I have to think about before I say every word that I do say and, and do everything that I do do in that classroom. Yeah, so social awareness, yeah. Cool. Chris, your thoughts? Yeah, I agree with Makaya. I work in a school, a construction school, so basically a lot of students don't want to be there, they don't want to do this, they don't want to do that. You gotta basically figure out how to talk to them and make them understand that they need to do certain things that they don't want to do because that's life. Marlon, you want to go, or Stanley? Do you have thoughts, Marlon? We don't, we don't all have to answer everyone, so um, if you guys have thoughts, though. I just think it's a very important thing to learn, and I feel like soft skills should be taught at a young age, so it's harder for people to understand later on as they're, um, they're older. It's a little bit harder to understand, so if you're taught at a young age, it's, I feel like it's, it would be way better. Mm -hmm. um, I agree with everything that has uh, been stated. Uh, and to me, soft skills is, um, like was stated, how we interact with one another. Uh, and there's been a lot of momentum over the years on young people uh, developing soft skills uh, because they are what is needed to thrive in the workplace, such as creativity, communication, uh, critical thinking, uh, et cetera. I agree. Cool. I just sort of, um, uh, point of explanation, um, the young people in launch, um, several of them did extensive technical coursework concurrent with earning, you know, completing 12th grade. Uh, and so as part of their launch experience, uh, Makaya, Chris, and Marlon right now are all at, working as teaching assistants back with the training providers they worked with. So Makaya is a teaching assistant in a computer science classroom at one of our high schools. Chris is a teaching assistant in an electrical program uh, that Youth Force partners with. So they are, um, they are sort of learning to take the technical skills they learned and teach the, um, the younger folk. In the spring, we will then be placing them with regional employers for uh, near full-time fellowships. So just the, they are, they are teachers, they, they meant that, yeah. Um, so let's, let's just talk, so with this, you know, this is a, this is a somewhat non-traditional path. You know, I think the sort of, the, the story, um, the sort of the story or the narrative that I think a lot of young people get is, you know, you're gonna go off to college, you'll go live in a dorm, it will be magical, there will be parties on the quad all the time, whatever, whatever you all were told by your teachers. Um, each of you is taking, you know, a somewhat non-traditional path in the way you're doing your work. Stanley, um, you know, is doing college coursework and is the <laughs> executive director of the Forum for Opportunity Youth, right? We've got, you know, we're doing launch, which is a non-traditional experience. Can you all t talk us through what, what led you to choose these non-traditional pathways? Um, and, and then we'll sort of circle back around with a second question, which is, and, and would you recommend doing sort of a non-traditional route to other, to other young people? Um, Stanley, do you mind starting and just thinking through sort of how you chose your, your route and your pathway? Sure, so uh, after I graduated high school, um, I actually made the decision to uh, live the traditional uh, college uh, experience, um, signed up uh, to live on campus, and I realized uh, in the middle of scheduling uh, that all of my classes were online with the exception of a few core classes. Uh, and the reason for that is because my university, my particular concentration, uh, all of the professors uh, or professors at uh, other universities across the U.S. Um, so I went and talked with uh, the counselor and I said, could I just be a 100% online student? And she kind of criticized me for that. And I went back home and I talked uh, with my parents. Uh, they also criticized me. Uh, <laughs> and so it was one of those decisions that I kind of didn't really get approval from, uh, did take everyone's feedback. Um, and I decided uh, that I was going to attend school uh, online. Uh, in addition to doing some great work uh, with organizations, uh, I was provided the opportunity uh, to actually work uh, for the Rapids Foundation, uh, which is actually present here today uh, after high school, uh, and uh, continued to do nonprofit work. Uh, in 2018, I decided to run for school board. Uh, so I believe that all of those experiences uh, of making that decision of attending college online uh, has, uh, even though I don't have that field experience that sometimes I'll get in the classroom, 
I have that field experience uh, that relates directly to my major of nonprofit work and being an elected official on the school board. Thank you. Cool. So, um, my experience is very untraditional. Um, I did during high school have plans of going to a four year university. You know, I still applied, I still, you know, made all my applications. Um, but I realized I didn't really want to be taking anything that did not deal with software development. So taking all the other classes to me was like, I knew it wasn't a waste of time, but it wasn't where I was trying to go. Um, and a lot of people that I knew that went to university for things like computer science, um, the stuff I had already been learning at my technical training was, you know, levels ahead. Um, so it was sort of easy for me to make that decision once I realized that, you know, I can go the route that I, taking only what I want to take um, and getting that hands-on experience. Um, that's why I really cherish my internships because I knew that if I wasn't gonna go to university that this is what I'm gonna be doing. I'm gonna be working. I'm gonna be learning on the, in the job. And so that's, that's why I like the untraditional path. Um, After I graduated high school, I spent the summer working with the construction company I currently work for. And my boss asked me would I like to sit down with you for us after, after class and talk with them and see if I like what they had to hear. And they talked to me about getting a job, going to college, and that's things that I wanted to do. So I, I, cho I chose to go with you for us. And um, I'm kind of glad I didn't go for the traditional four-year college route. Um, as I saw my brother, he went to a four-year college. He kind of really struggled to, through it. And in the end, when, I, um, when he graduated just the same time I graduated high school, thank God not the same day again because middle school was a drag. Like, <laughs> same day. Um, so he graduated and he struggled a lot finding a job because um, there's a lot of people graduating college, trying to find a job, but they're asking for um, a lot of experience. And it was really hard for him, so I kind of thought about it, and I was like, if I'm gonna go to college, spend all this money, and then struggle to find a job, is that really what I want? So I decided to go um, keep working for like, I was gonna take a gap year, work um, the job I currently had, um, currently have. Um, I was gonna keep working until I could afford classes at Delgado and take the classes I wanted to and just get a certificate. Um, and then one day I just got a call from Emily and it was like the best day. I was hearing all these things and I was like, what's the catch? Like, <laughs> I'm gonna have to pay something. Am I gonna have to do this? But once I'm in, now that I'm in the program, I'm like, I'm extremely grateful because it's everything I wanted. When I talked to my brother about it, I'm like, uh, he, he gives me this feedback. He's like, wow, like, if only everyone could do that after um, high school because it's way better than what he thinks is college because you're, get, you're given a job, you get your experiences, you're learning the path you want to take. You're not learning other, I'm not going to say unnecessary things, but you're not like focused on math whenever you're learn, you want to be like someone in the science field. It's like, not science field, but it's like, if you want to be some, like, a, like a major in art, you don't want to be taking math or something like that. Um, so that's, I'm really grateful for not taking this um, traditional pathway. For me, well, for everybody, um, I just struggle with Israel. So it's like, like, um, make yourself happy. If not going to college is, is a choice, then, not, then don't go. Because it's a waste of time, a waste of money. So I say just, like, just chase your dreams and follow them and be, you know, persistent with it. And, um, and be patient because I'm hard on myself and not going to college. Like, it, it was like a hard thing for me because um, 
I have to be doing something. I have to, I have to be into something so I can feel confident in myself. So choosing youth force was a great, a great choice I made because I'm doing something. I'm, I'm not at home all day sleeping or watching TV. I'm, I'm hopping up and I'm coming to school. So that's something that I'm confident, confident about and something that I appreciate from you for us. So um, I think we've got time for probably um, one or two questions from me and then we're gonna open it up to questions from the audience and I will open the magical app on the iPad to see what folks wanna know. Um, would love, you know, you all have lived rich lives and you know, had you know, very different high school experiences uh, and are now having very different post-high school experiences. What, are, what, are, what would you want education officials, taxpayers, um, other decision makers to know about what's working and what's not working and helping young people grow and thrive um, based on your experiences? And wh whoever is like ready to jump in, uh, you, you, guys, you sort of go first. What, what would you want folks to know about what's helping young people grow and thrive? Um, kind of want to start because I had a really hard high school experience. I took courses, which were IB courses, which is International Baccalaureate. I had eight classes. And imagine eight classes and a thousand word essay for each one of those classes due at the same time. And I feel that I would have succeeded more in those classes if, it, if the teachers were a bit more prepared. Um, we lost a lot of teachers and we were just kind of handed um, new teachers into that, those classes and I felt that if those teachers had the proper training, um, had a little bit more experience and were able to actually get through with us because we had to, we went to the classes, we did the work, but in the end it was like we were all struggling as much as the teacher was struggling to teach us the material and it was if the teacher doesn't understand how can we understand so i feel like what we're really missing is proper teacher training um, i feel like a lot of kids would benefit from that and especially teaching teachers how to handle students a little bit better i felt really comfortable with my teachers um, even though they weren't prepared enough, they always made the extra effort and they always made you feel extremely comfortable with them, like they were one of us. And um, they know how to set their boundaries. They're not extremely like um, professional, but they're at that level where we can understand them and they can understand us. Um, but that's pretty much it. I just feel like high school would have been way better if we had proper teacher training. Thank you, Marlon. Other thoughts, things jump to mind for y'all? Um, yeah, so for me, I think it's important to make sure that there are lots of options for students in school. Um, I know there's not that many options at my school because I went to science and mathematics school, so everything is geared towards science and mathematics, which I was fine with, but um, like not everyone wants to go into software development. Not everyone wants to be a chemist. So having the right amount of options for students is important because I have a lot of friends who still knew they didn't want to take the traditional path, but also didn't find what they wanted to do in high school. So their journey after high school is, is really different from mine because I know, but, but they don't have that. You know, they didn't, they didn't find the right opportunity in high school. So I think having and making sure that you have a bunch of options for, for children and the youth to try during their high school career is important. That's cool. Thank you, Makaya. Other thoughts? Stanley? Um, I think it's very important uh, for education officials um, and other professionals to see things in both content and context. Um, and as a school board member um, and also as a sociology major, it's so easy for me sometimes to just see what's in front of me or what the research is saying. However, it's also very important that I see things in context and that I'm listening uh, to students, that I'm listening to teachers. Uh, that helps inform my decision making or just my philosophy about a particular education issue. So I think that it's very important that we are really aligning both 
uh, listening to what the research and the data and the statistics are, but at the same time, uh, listening to those voices and really getting student and teachers experiences, those individuals that are on the ground as well. Also parents as well. Other thoughts, Chris, or no pressure on Montero, if you guys have thoughts. You do have I'll them. give it down. Okay, cool. Um, all right, there's, so one thing I actually want to just extend, Stanley, I'm, I sort of started looking at some of the audience questions, and I feel like, St Stanley, sort of what you just said about sort of listening to young people, there's something from the audience that I feel like could just be a good segue, and then we can hop back to questions for me, but there's a question from somebody in the audience that wants to know, did you all feel listened to in high school? That's a good question. No. Off the top, no. Elaborate. So, <laughs> um, I, I kind of like, I felt that, yes, they said they, they can hear me, but do they understand me? That's the thing. They hear me, but they don't understand me. They feel that I'm just a child, so they know better than I do. Um, they work years in what they're doing and they know better than I do, but I, I don't think that's correct. I feel like I'm living that experience, so I know how it feels to be in that place. Like you can't tell me that you can't, I'm not supposed to feel pressured by all this amount of work. And I just felt that I wasn't being heard when I said I can't, I can't do this, I'm really stressed. Um, I can't handle this amount of work, and they're like, yes, you can. Other students did it. I'm like, did the other students get the diploma? <laughs> no. But I just kind of thought every time I made my voice, like, i try to, like, speak to them. They would be like, yes, I understand you, but you can do it. I'm like, okay, I guess I can do it. I, I couldn't do it in the end. And I kind of felt like if they would have listened to me, um, kind of took that advice I gave them about telling them that, okay, can you try to have the teachers do this and explain this a little more, or have the teachers kind of prepare a little more. Like I said earlier, um, maybe that would help. Or when I gave a complaint about a teacher saying that they're not really doing their job, they're just sitting there. Um, and now I have no idea what I'm writing an essay about, and, the, and it's due the next day. Um, I just felt like I wasn't being heard. I felt um, just like I had no voice. Reality, I felt that I was speaking, but it was coming out of one ear and just going out the other. Your thoughts? Um, I feel like some teachers don't, well, people in the school, you know, across the board, not everyone understands the non-traditional path. So, like, when you're a successful student in high school, to go to your school and start bringing up the idea that, hey, I'm not going to go to university or I'm thinking about not going to university, a lot of people are, like, you know, on the defense, like, you know, you should be doing this, you know, you've done all this, why aren't you continuing? And so I think um, it didn't really affect me because that, that kind of stuff doesn't get to me, but I'm glad I knew the path that I've chosen to go on now, like I'd be more successful than attending a four-year university, was good. Thank you. Other thoughts? You guys good? All right, there's some, there's some great questions from the audience. So I feel like we should, um, I feel like I figured out this app thing too. Um, so, you know, I think, Stanley, you, stand, you shared a great story about, you know, the counselor at McNeese didn't think you, your, your sort of choices were a great idea. Your families weren't totally convinced. Your choices were a great idea. Each of you, I know I've had some conversations with you about your families and some of the choices you're making. N now that you're a little bit along these different pathways you've taken, further along in some cases, wh what are your conversations sound like with your families? What's, what's the sort of, what's the latest conversation you've had with your parents about what you're doing, Stanley, or sort of for some of you, what are, what are any of the conversations or feedback you're getting with these folks now that you're You've walked through the door. You're on this, this, this different pathway. Um, last night I was talking to my mom. She called me. She lives in Houston. And um, I was asking her about if I get hired out of state, like, what would I do, right? So, um, and I've been talking to a bunch of people about this. Like, um, I don't plan on living in New Orleans if I don't have to. Um, so I'm looking to get hired out of state. 
And so just like weighing the options of like, how will I move? Like, how will this work? All these new things that I've never done before. Um, and this is conversations I wouldn't be having if I was in college, um, you know, I'd be taking my coursework. But for someone that's, you know, actively like searching and, and has the skills that they need in order to get a successful job, like these are the conversations that I'm able to have with the people close to me. And I would say that um, you can't please everybody. You cannot please everybody. So, so like people have opinions about everything, about, about everything. So I say personally, I keep my life personally from my family. And that's for a reason, because it's like, oh, don't do that. Oh, like, I didn't, I, I'm not telling you to tell me don't do it. I'm asking for your support. So support, like, if you aren't uh, supporting me, then I don't need you. And, and, and that goes for anybody. Mm -hmm. So I say that. And I completely agree with that, because I'm kind of the same way. I'm really independent. I don't like telling people my business a lot. Like, my, as, like, as far as my parents, I don't like to tell them a lot. They're always like, you're never home. Um, you're just like, we never know what you're doing, but we're no, it's gotten to the point where they're like, we don't know what you're doing, but when you do tell us what we're doing, uh, what you're doing, then it's crazy all the stuff you did. I'm like, yes, I go to school in the morning, and then at night, like around eight, I come home from work, and it's just, they're, I, I know that they're proud because when the small moments I do tell them, um, and they're just like, I can't believe you're doing more than your older brothers. I'm just like. <laughs> Other thoughts, any other sort of follow-up conversations you have with families? Um, so conversations with families. I am, uh, I have an older sister, and so my parents always say that you are a lot easier to raise. However, you are going to prove a point and say, I told you so. So uh, when tuition uh, came in and the switch from being on campus reflected to being 100% online, I made sure, sure to show that comparison to my parents. Uh, and they were like, oh, wow. Uh, but they still were not just that convinced yet. Um, once they started to see that even though I was 100% online, I still had a connection to the university. Uh, I go on McNeese campus a lot to present uh, to education classes on the structure of school board. Uh, a lot of my assignments are field-based assignments, and so uh, it's kind of easy for me to do those assignments because I'm already having those conversations with individuals. I'm already connected to organizations that are doing work that are sometimes required in those assignments. Uh, and so my parents are thrilled that I have made that decision, and so I think that it's important, and my duty uh, is uh, to provide as much support uh, to young people uh, who may want to make that same decision. Uh, and like was stated earlier, uh, it is that individual's path. And so it is important that we are not providing uh, negative information, that we are clearly supporting them in that process. Thank you, Stanley. So um, I'm going to have you all close in just a minute. I just want to share with you, I think you've so impressed the audience that you um, have now um, some moms, dads, aunties, teachers in the audience who are messaging me advice. So, um, <laughs> so they, um, they want to make sure you remember that you have a civic duty to vote and your voice really matters. And so to make sure you are registered voters. They want to continue to encourage your love of STEM because that is where many of the high wage opportunities lie. But they also want to encourage you to be well-rounded so that you read the classics and see the arts, I think is what I'm reading into one of these. Um, and I just think overall, I'm getting lots of like super excitement for you guys. I want to make sure you know that. So I'm going to ask each of you, yes, yes. Um, I will say um, all, of, all of these young people have LinkedIn profiles. Um, and so you are now their professional network in this room. We know that we advance through social capital and professional networks, so they will look for your connections. 
Um, and um, so I, I just want to get you all closing word, final advice for your new family and your new professional network. What, anything else you want them to know? That these are big decision makers. Anything else you want them to know about helping young people thrive? The youth is the future, so remember they will be the ones taking care of you. <laughs> Good? Good. I think that was good enough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. This is wonderful. Thank you. Oh, you're going to do Edgar? That was incredible. Okay, to the final word before my final thank yous. Um, I chose this one very intentionally. Uh, we have someone who is known to many of you, who I think many would say um, is a moral compass for our collective work. I'd like to introduce Edgar Villanueva, whose book, Decolonizing Wealth, has, I think, lit our community on fire. When I heard he was doing a book signing last night, I was like, is there anyone who hasn't read it yet? Um, so if you haven't, or if you have, uh, I think he's the perfect person to summarize uh, what do these three days all mean for us, and where do we go from here? Good afternoon, family. Am I really loud out there? I'm kind of a loud person, okay. Well, I'm honored to be here with you all to land this plane. Um, we at the Schott Foundation really appreciate the GFE community and um, our partnerships with many of you all. And just to be a part of this, um, this ecosystem of organizations that are pushing through um, these conversations to really figure out how we best use our position of philanthropy to advance uh, social change and improve education in this country. Um, so uh, this plane ride that we're about to be on, that we're, you know, I'm gonna land this plane and I promise we'll land safely. I have a lot of flying hours under my belt at this point in time. It may feel a little bumpy for a minute, but hang in there and fasten your seatbelt and um, we'll have a good time. Um, I wanna just say, first of all, I am a proud public school graduate. Um, and uh, although I was known as a student to turn in my assignments at the very last minute, so I didn't prepare slides because I was at the very last minute put, pulling together uh, my thoughts for this. But if you're on Twitter, you can go to the hashtag for this conference, hashtag EdFunders19, and you will see my lovely photo from my high school graduation um, that I uh, wanted to share with you guys. But I graduated from public schools in Raleigh, North Carolina, Wake County, and um, a little bit more about that story. My family is from, I'm gonna see if I can transition to this. How's that, okay. My, my family is from the Lumbee tribe, which is in southeastern North Carolina, um, about two hours from where I actually grew up. And the Lumbee tribe is situated in Robinson County, North Carolina, which is one of the poorest, most diverse counties uh, in the country. And uh, when I was only five years old, my mom, who was uh, a teen mother, uh, scooped me up and we moved two hours away to Raleigh so that I would have a better uh, opportunity to go to better schools there. And that decision to uproot our small family and to relocate made all the difference in my life. I didn't realize it until later as I was uh, moving up through the grades and still going back home to uh, my tribal community to visit with my family, the difference in our schools. So for example, in my high school, I had uh, for my Spanish class, Dr. Pajina, Dr. Page, a PhD prepared educator, and I was like virtually fluent in Spanish. Now my cousins back in Robinson County, their Spanish class consisted of um, someone rolling in a TV cart, watching a movie in Spanish with English subtitles with a teacher who didn't speak Spanish. That was as good as it got. And so I always felt, uh, you know, the, the inequalities between where we lived and where my cousin lived. And then those outcomes are very apparent now that we're all adults. I'm the first person in my family to graduate from high school. I'm the only person that's made it to college. 
every one of my cousins back in Robinson County, only two hours away, um, fell into the cycles of poverty and trauma and abuse. Every uh, female cousin that I had was pregnant by the age of 15, and they just kind of fell into the trap um, of, of all the things there that have been, you know, sort of um, plaguing my community for, for many years. And so um, we know, the folks in this room, that race and place matter, right? Race and place matter when it comes to outcomes. Now, I couldn't change my race as a Native American. I couldn't change the history that my community has experienced. But I was fortunate enough that my mom decided to change our place. And, you know, that happened, but that did not come without a loss. We lost a connection to our family. I, left, I lost a connection to my Native indigenous identity. I was the only Native American in the whole public school system in Raleigh at that time. I lost connection to my, my ways of culture, my ways of being that added to an identity crisis for me. But that's what we had to give up in order for me to have access to quality public schools. And so I wanna challenge us today with the question of why haven't children, and especially children like my cousins, and kids of color around this country, why haven't they received the education that they deserve? In order for us to advance justice and equity, the things of this conference, I wanna propose that we first have to take a quick look back and I don't have a lot of time to do a big history lesson here today, so if you haven't read the book, you just have to read it. But um, I'm gonna squeeze in just a little bit here. 500 years ago, a virus touched the shores of this country, the virus of colonization. I call it the colonizer virus. And actually, the very first point of contact in the United States was in my community in North Carolina. This virus that I talk about um, has the dynamics and the mantra of dividing and conquering, commanding and controlling, and above all, exploiting. Now, let's be clear, because we're coming up on a time of Thanksgiving. Um, November is Native American Heritage Month. So these are things that we talk about a lot in our community, the dynamics of colonization and, and the lasting impact. We are often confused about colonization, and that word is sort of a, a word that we put into a historical context. And um, we, we have imaginations, and um, actually we teach in many public schools that colonization was uh, this very, uh, you know, the colonizers were heroes, and um, we, we lift those folks up in our, in our, our teachings. But however, we know the acts of colonizations were, were very, were, the acts of colonization were very violent. And these acts are not just historical, they are still happening as we speak. Violent acts are happening right now as we sit in this room. Kids are being separated from their families and put in cages. So colonization is still happening in the U.S. and around the world. However, the colonizer virus that I want to talk about for just a moment has mutated and often shows up in more subtle ways that are not as violent right before our eyes. They show up in what the virus shows up in ways that we can't even see it. Uh, we don't even see the acts of division and separation and exploitation because the dynamics have been baked into our very way of existing and thinking. But trust me, the colonizer virus is alive and well, and it exists inside our culture and our institutions where it is especially dangerous. Our agriculture and food system reflects the colonizer virus. Our foreign policy in this country reflects the colonizer virus. Our envir environmental policy uh, reflects the colonizer virus. The field of design, I could go on and on. And yes, our education system in this country reflects the colonizer virus. And even us, our sector, the sector of philanthropy, we reflect the colonizer virus. This week, we've heard numerous ways about how the colonizer virus shows up in our work and what folks are doing to fight it. While our public education system has had extensive reach, uh, we've you know, heard inspiring stories about folks overcoming great odds to succeed. We're still struggling to, to make sure that all kids, especially kids of color, have access to a quality public education. We've witnessed models uh, this week supported by philanthropy to help kids cope with trauma. Um, we've reinforced the value of community schools. We've heard about strategies to meaningfully incorporate student voice. Yet we are failing as a community and as a sector when many of America's children are not receiving the education they deserved, deserve and are promised as a constitutional and human right. 
When our education improvement efforts, efforts, even those created under the banner of equity, do not center children and families of color, when we have not focused our resources at the margin where the pain is the worst, then we are falling trapped to the colonizing virus. So as a sector today, I want us to ask ourselves the hard questions. We sit on $900 billion of philanthropic capital. It's a nice chunk of change, right? Education gets the biggest chunk of that capital. So why haven't we provided for children the education that they deserve? So quickly, this is um, something that I've been thinking about. I want you all to jot this down, or if you're on Twitter, I just tweeted it uh, because um, it's, it's a statement that's loaded with a lot of things to unpack, and I won't unpack them all right now, but we know that poverty is the biggest driver of educational outcomes, right? We can have, you know, teacher improvement programs, and those are great, and those are important. We can look at curric curriculum, and that's great, and that's important. But what's happening outside the classroom, children living in poverty, is the biggest driver of education out, um, educational outcomes, and we need to look at it. So this is what I want you to remember, that poverty is the product of public policy and theft facilitated by white supremacy. I'm gonna say it one more time, and then I'll unpack it just a little bit, and then we'll land the plane. This is a little bit of turbulence, maybe, for some folks. Hold on, fasten your seatbelt. It's gonna be all right. So poverty is the product of public policy and theft facilitated by white supremacy. What does that mean? So in order to see poverty eradicated, we must look at investments into the various assets of this formula. So public policy, let's start there. To get to fair and just public policy, we must build people power. This includes moving resources and capacity to grassroots organizations on the front lines of education justice creating cohesive networks across issue areas, not just education, right, to leverage local and regional impact and build national movements for change. At the Schott Foundation, we believe that philanthropic partners and grassroots organizations can actually work together to uphold democracy and to build power in marginalized communities for education justice. Now, what about the theft part of that sentence when I said poverty is a product of public policy and theft? All right, so just real quickly, because I can really talk about that for a while, but I won't. So we have to look at how wealth has been accumulated in this country, right? Our legacy of slavery, genocide, stolen land. Wealth is concentrated in white um, communities because of our history of theft. And so even us as foundations, we have to explore the question, where did our money and resources come from? When we do that research, we often find that we as a sector have benefited from that legacy of colonization and slavery as well. And so as, in essence, when we think about closing the race wealth gap, we have to remember that wealth was stolen. So how do we put wealth back into communities to repair what has happened? The word reparations is a big scary word for a lot of folks, but it is a conversation that's happening right now on the political circuit. And for me, reparations is not a scary word because it simply means repair. If we know that wealth was once stolen from communities and that wealth was built on the backs of people of color and indigenous folks, then we have to honor that history and think about us who hold resources, who have access to resources. How can we repair and close the race wealth gap by moving money and resources into communities of color. And I'm not talking about just great grant making. Like, yes, we need to increase funding to communities of color, but we have to move serious capital into communities of color if we're going to eradicate poverty. And so for me, uh, in essence, when we're thinking about that $900 billion of capital, um, we know that on average about 5 to 7% of that money goes out to grants to the community, right? About $60 billion a year. Recent data shows that only about 75 to 8% of grant making goes to communities of color. Only 75 to 8%. And for me, this is unjust. When we think of the history that people of color have played in helping to accumulate wealth, and that we only benefit from seven and a half to eight percent of grant making, we have to ask ourselves, what are we doing as a sector to really address poverty and get to the root causes of issues if we're continuing to marginalize communities of color in our grant making? So then finally, uh, white supremacy, and that, that might be where some folks wanna tighten up real, 
uh, real tight on the seatbelt, but relax because when I talk about white supremacy, I'm not talking about white relatives in the room. I'm not talking about white people. White supremacy is an ideology that somebody made up that's not a real thing. Right? It's an ideology that we have to dismantle. And, but although it's not a real thing, we have shaped systems and policies and beliefs and narratives around this thing that we have to dismantle. In our work in philanthropy, we must know and understand that we will not be effective at transforming education in our communities with race neutral grant making. Anybody want to clap for that? Okay. I hope at least a few people believe that, all right? We cannot be affected with race-neutral grant making. We are trying to solve problems that are not race-neutral, right? So we cannot have strategies that are race-neutral and, and be effective. We must privilege the investment in organizations led by and accountable to communities of color and stop designing strategies for communities of color and people of color that do not bring them to the table and, and allow them to co-create these solutions for our communities. We must also do the work of exploring our investments. I have to say this every chance I get. The 95% right, of, of, of the corpus that we hold um, uh, in the investments that are not going out the door of our foundations. Any education foundation, any foundation that is investing in education but has investments from their endowment tied up in private prisons has to do some exploration around what is the net value of that philanthropy. I would even go as far to say that we have to question the moral compass and the values of that institution. We must divest in um, portfolio, from portfolios that are harming our young people. Now in closing, all right, we're making our descent. We're making our descent here. <laughs> How do we begin to heal the colonizer virus in our institutions, in our community, in our country? In my community, we, we, we use the word decolonize, and just to keep it really simple, an easy way to understand decolonization, it's just about healing. It's acknowledging that our history of colonization has violated us and has traumatized all of us. And in fact, it has that effect whether we are descendants of the colonized or descendants of the colonizer. All of, an, all of us in this room have some sort of trauma that are remnants of our history in this country. Now, while we cannot undo 500 years of damage, what we can do is this. We can focus on healing by stopping the cycles of abuse and healing ourselves in order to expand the possibilities for the future. This means that our interdependence is inescapable, so we might as well acknowledge the trauma that we all hold and engage in healing together. Friends, we are at a critical juncture. Decades of progress of, and, and, and progressive policies on race, social, economic inequalities in our country have been attacked, are dismantled in this tumultuous political climate. Marginalized communities face sanctioned threats to their well-being every day through systems and policies that fuel predatory practices. The various opportunity gaps continue to widen and leave already vulnerable communities in harm. So we as a philanthropic sector must transcend our egos thinking that we know best. We must transcend our theories of changes and eligibility requirements that often redline certain groups and resources. We must transcend our silver bullet solutions that often reinforce silos and don't see children for the whole people they are in communities. And we must transcend the inequalities that we, we as a sector, are reinforcing by moving money to where the hurt is the worst. And the hurt is the worst in communities of color that are still grappling with layers and layers of trauma that have been imposed on them because of their histories. So in conclusion, a few calls to action here. I want us to all make a commitment to holding up the mirror. We throw these terms around diversity, equity, inclusion. Do some deep personal reflection on what these terms really mean to you and ask yourselves, what are you doing to maintain or disrupt the status quo? What are you doing to give up power and to share power with others? I also want us all to make a lifelong commitment 
right? Right now, equity and justice, these are buzzwords at every conference. We've all heard them. And the, these are hot topics in philanthropy right now. But this is something that cannot be a fad. This cannot be something that's a fly-by-night conversation. We all have to make a lifelong commitment to do this work, not just, a, not, not just in a conference, not just in a training at your foundation, but in your own personal lives and in your families. If the only time that you talk about equity is at a conference or at work, then that's not going to get us there. We have to do this work in our communities and with our people to get to a place of truth and reconciliation. I want us to make a commitment to go deeper. Let's go bolder. Let's be radical asking the hard questions, right? Let's look at our data. Where are our grants going? Who are be being benefited? Are we investing in communities that have been marginalized by our sector? What are we doing uh, to transition power to these communities? And then finally, I'll say this, learn by funding. We are obsessed in our sector on looking at data and having another report. Everybody in this room has everything that you need to do this work, right? You will never be an expert. <laughs> if you're not from a, a community of color or an, or an indigenous community, you will never have uh, um, all the information you need to be the expert, right? But you can learn by funding. The community does not have time for us to like get up to speed on this. We've got to start moving resources now and moving resources in a real way in order to get to where we need to achieve equity. So I challenge you to go back, look at your, your grants, uh, look at your portfolio. Are you funding organizations led by people of color? Are you funding an indigenous organization? Are you funding organizations that are on the front lines doing grassroots organizing? There are lots of folks in this room who have been doing this work of equity for a long time, like us at the Schott Foundation, and we're happy to talk with you and to connect with you to help you um, on your journey. And in closing, I just want to leave you with um, sort of a, an indigenous uh, saying or a uh, worldview, um, a way of, of, of thinking about this work moving forward, and it's simply the idea of all my relations. Have you guys heard that? All my relations. All my, all my relations simply means that it's a belief that all of our suffering is mutual, all of our healing is mutual, and all of our thriving is mutual. And we really believe that. The decisions that we are making as a sector today are going to impact young people for seven generations to come. And when we are asking for your resources and investment into communities of color, we're not asking for a handout. We're not asking for a charitable contribution. We are extending a lifeline into your own humanity that's going to lead to all of our collective liberation and freedom. And so take these, uh, take these notes home with you, dig in, do the hard work, make yourself uncomfortable. It's okay. And um, let's move some resources um, to, you know, behind these, um, what we've heard today and what we've heard this week at this conference, put some resources behind these people of color and these organizations of color that are on the front lines leading the way. So thank you so much. I will be fast, but this is perhaps the most important thing. I want to thank everyone who made this conference what it is. I had no idea what I was getting into. I'm really proud of where we ended up, and I'm really grateful for all of your participation. I want to thank first my board of directors and point out just a few people. So Caroline Altman-Smith is going to be our president next year. <laughs> Sanjeev Rao is going to be our Vice President. Amy Kerwin, our Secretary. And Richard Togley, our President, uh, Treasurer. <laughs> uh, I also want to welcome two new members of our board who are just starting, have just started in the past few months. Um, one is Sarah Sneed from the NEA Foundation. And the other is John Garcia, who runs the philanthropic arm of the LA County Office of Education. So thank you to the board, who's been really supportive of me in my first year. All right, next, I want to say thank you to our conference planning committee. I'm going to be quick here. So first of all, 
um, a repeat, Amy Kerwin doing double duty. <laughs> um, she was our uh, conference committee chair this year and was just incredibly, incredibly helpful to me and really dug in because I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> um, and I also want to thank Mark Chun, Rebecca Goldberg, Leslie Garola, uh, Deirdre Johnson Burrell, Jenny Achilles, Rudolph Colon, uh, Braulio, sorry, <laughs> uh, Rebecca Gomez, Elsie Hansen, uh, Colinius Newsom, uh, Delia Orlando Weldon from Nellie May, uh, Sue Kyoi, uh, Cornelia Grumman, Mac Howison, Angela Sanchez, and Jeff Sunshine. Uh, it was a really, really great group. I'm still learning how to work with this group, and I uh, really got a lot of good feedback on how to just kind of run that whole process better in the future, so hooray. Uh, and the last, very last but not least, I want to thank our team. Um, <clears throat> My team had an incredible project plan for this conference that basically starts in December and runs through the year. And so each month and each week, I was able to um, basically just get teed up for what I needed to do to make this what it was on this day. Uh, and, you know, and then each week, I would do my check-ins with team members, and they'd say, I did X, Y, Z, Q, L, M, N, O, P. Um, and you just have to do one thing. So very grateful. So I'll start with uh, Paul Moon, who is our pro senior program manager, and he's the person who really kind of pulls this all together. Rebecca Smith is um, the one on Twitter and the one who every single uh, word that you have seen come out of GFE regarding the conference came from Rebecca. Uh, Jesse Lee, Alessandra Piani, Angela Taylor, Kyle Moon, Hannah Wang, and our brand new addition, uh, whom I think many of you met, uh, Beverly Ross Denny, who's our managing director. Uh, so thank you to all of those people. Uh, I'm just really grateful. All right. Go forth and prosper. Uh, for those of you who are headed to the site visit this afternoon, hooray. Um, and we will see you all next year in New York. <laughs>